Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Kings chapter number 18. 1 Kings chapter number 18. If you are um, a Bible reader or know much about the Bible, you know exactly what we're going to look at. And that is the story of Elijah on top of Mount Carmel. And the Bible teaches that God is omnipresent. He's everywhere all the time. But there are times in life and in the life of a church when God sends revival and God's power and His presence are made known. Proverbs, I mean Hebrews chapter 12 verse 29 says, For our God is a consuming fire. When we first get saved, we're very passionate about sharing the gospel and we're very uh, excited about coming to church and excited about studying His Word. But it seems like as time goes on, that fire burns out. And we wonder why our young people are not interested uh, in church. We wonder why as soon as they get a chance that, that they're, they, they leave and it seems like they, they don't ever come back. It's because our fire as, as a church has burnt out. I'm talking about the church as a whole has burnt out. And they come into the church and people look miserable and, and I understand why. Because they go outside the church and they find more life in other stuff than inside the church. The church, I think it's a Disney thing, something about the happiest place on earth. The church should be the happiest place on earth. Amen. We have something, we are the only people in this world to have something that to truly be happy about. We have been, if we are a part of the church, not the, the, the church building, but a part of the global church, then we have been saved, justified, and are being sanctified, and one day we'll be glorified by God Almighty. That is something to be happy about. The devil looks at the church today and he says, you can have your sound systems, you can have your staff. You can have your money, you can have your nice buildings, but as long as you don't have the power of God Almighty, that's all I care about. And so in this text, in 1 Kings chapter number 18, what's going on is there is a king of Israel named King Ahab, and he is very wicked. And Israel has gotten so perverted that they started worshiping the God of Baal. And they thought the Baal made uh, the cows to have calves and the grass to grow and the flowers to blossom and all that. And they started worshiping him. And so God uh, sent judgment on Israel. And there has been a drought for about three and a half years. And so Elijah goes up to Ahab and he says, Gather all the people together on the Mount Carmel and look at verse 21. This is what he says. Uh, Chapter number 18, verse 21, he says, Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. And so Elijah says, listen, we've got to make a choice. Either we're going to serve God or we're not. Quit straddling the, the fence. Quit trying to play games. Quit trying to, uh, to, to hesitate is the word that he says. We have to choose we, whether we're going to serve God or not. So he goes on to say, he says, y'all present a sacrifice on your altar and call to your God. I'm going to build a, uh, an altar and present a sacrifice on my altar and I'm going to call to my God or the the only one and true God and the, and the God that answers by fire is the God will serve. Everybody agreed. Everybody uh, was okay with that. And so they did their thing. They built their altar. Look in verse 26. This is, what, this is what they did. Then they took the ox which was given them and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice and no one answered. Answered. Baal obviously did not answer. And so now we come to Elijah's turn. And this is where we find ourselves in verse 30 of chapter number 18. Verse 30 says this, Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had said, had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. What I want us to get from those two verses is, is in order for 
the fire to fall or God to send revival to an individual, to a church, to a nation, whatever you, you want to call it, the first thing that we're going to have to do is prepare for the fire. Heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. A preacher told me that one time. Revival is a prepared place for prepared people. God does not just send revival uh, and, and over, override our, our free will and, and force revival on people. Revival is something that we, we can't just grab it and take, but has to be received from God. And God, we cannot receive it if we're not prepared. And so how, how did Elijah re, uh, prepare? Well, if you look back in verse 30, he said, it says that he repaired the altar of the Lord which had been torn down. The altar in this day and time is where they presented their sacrifices, of course, but it was where they worshiped God. Uh, worship is anything that glorifies and exalts God. People say, well, I, I didn't get any, anything out of church today. Well, you don't come to church to worship. You bring your worship to church. Worship is what you do all throughout the week in, in, in your Bible study, and your obedience to God, and the things with the, which the Spirit leads you to do. You, you bring all of that to church. You don't just come to church to worship. Everything that you've done throughout the week, you bring it to church. The highest form of worship is obedience. And so I'm, I've just got a, a three or four things written down. There's so much more, uh, but, but uh, as far as uh, that, that I'm only going to be able to get into just a few of today. But uh, in order to repair our worship here, I just want to give you a few aspects of how we do that. We sacrificially serve God. Romans 12.1 says, Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. The NIV translates that last phrase, your true and proper worship. In order for, for God's fire to fall, in order for us to experience revival, we're going to have to sacrificially serve God. Understanding that we are, we are totally committed to God's will for our life, no matter what that brings. If it's good times, I'm okay with that. If it's bad times, I'm okay with that because I'm in the will of God. We have to understand that, that, that being a Christian, being in God's will is cross-bearing. Jesus said, uh, if you don't take up your cross and follow me, then you cannot be one of my disciples. Being a Christian is sacrificially serving God. Not eat, not serving God when it's easy, but it's sacrificing. It's never ceasing uh, to seek Jesus. Just wanting to know God at a more personal level. That uh, takes sacrifice because if we're going to know God and know Jesus in a more deep and rich way, then he's going to have to carry us through some stuff. He's going to have to lead us and guide us. And you say, well, I'm just trying to figure out God's will for my life. Well, that's fine. But there's a big difference in trying to figure out God's will for your life and knowing God's will and not doing it. Big difference. Uh, I, we're the, in, in the youth, we're going through Jonah. When In chapter 1, God told Jonah, he said, get your stuff and go to Nineveh. That was a clear call from God. Jonah knew exactly what God wanted him to do, and he disobeyed it. We want to make the excuse that we're trying to, to find God's will, and, and, and we're trying to do this and do that. One preacher I heard one time says, God's will is not lost. When God speaks, he speaks directly and specifically. Not only do we sacrificially serve God, we, we need to reconsider, and I say we, that means me too. We need to reconsider the attitude behind our giving and our tithes. Paul said in 2 Corinthians, he said, He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let me ask you a question, church. Why do you give? Why do, do you give your tithes and your offerings? Why uh, do, do you give with, uh, of your money that you work so hard for? God is not after our actions as much as he is our intents, our intentions, why we do what we do. He told the Pharisees, he said, hey, you know it's written that you don't need to commit adultery and you don't need to murder. But I'll tell you, if you have hate in your heart or if you lust, then you've already committed it. He was after what was on the inside. He was after their intentions. I had a guy at work one time. 
it was my boss. He said he was telling one of the other co-workers, he says, man, he says, the first thing I do when I get my bonus at the end of the year is I write a big check to the church. Now listen, if you're going to say that, and, and that's the reason why you do it, don't do it at all. God is after our intent. It's like uh, Brother Tim prayed, our left hand is not supposed to know what our right hand does. We're supposed to give privately, and we're supposed to give cheerfully, not, not grudgingly, not because we have to, not because we're made to, but because we want to. That's why we get If that's not your attitude behind it, then don't do it. Not only do we need to sacrificially serve God and reconsider our attitude behind our giving and tithes, but thirdly, we just need to take time to be thankful. First Thessalonians, Paul wrote, in everything give thanks. Not, he, said that didn't, he didn't say give thanks for all things, but he said give thanks in all things. And it's more than, than, than just saying the blessing when you eat. It's more than just uh, praying at church. It's more than that. It's thanking God for all that he's done for us. It's thanking God for, if we can't thank God for anything, we can thank God for sending his son Jesus to die on the cross for us. We can thank God for, for our friends and our family that God has placed around us. We can thank God for, for financially blessing us. We can thank God for all of the blessings that God has given us. And if you are too busy to take time to thank God, you are too busy. I'm guilty of that just as, as bad as anybody. I, I, I wrote down a, a phrase that says, it's very hard to complain, to be negative, or to be ungrateful if you are constantly thanking God. Not only being thankful, but loving sincerely. First John says this, he says, if we love one another... God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. The two greatest commandments that Jesus gave is to love God and love our neighbor. Are we, are we truly loving God sincerely? What do you mean by that? I'm saying, do we love the giver, or do we love the gifts that he gives? Do we love the blessings that God gives us, or do we love God? When, when we when we love God only for what he gives us or the things that he blesses us with, when we don't have those, we stop loving God. Either we're going to love God for who he is or we're not. That's, that's what I'm saying. When, 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 when we do that, when, when things don't go our way or when God seems distant or we, we think that, that God's off somewhere, when, when, we, when we truly love God for him and not the blessing that he gives us in those bad times, we can, we can still uh, persevere and we can still hold on to our love for God, not only uh, God but our neighbor. How can we as a church, as a church body, as far as said Baptist Church, how can we convince Jasper, Alabama that God loves them if, if we do not love them? God has chosen us to, to send his message throughout the world. He could have chose anything. He could have chose the angels. He could have chose whatever he wanted to. But he chose the church, not just preachers, not just Sundays. He chose the church to send his message throughout the world. And we're to do that like Jesus did it. Jesus did it out of love, out of compassion, out of mercy and grace. And like I said, if we are going to try to convince or to relay the message that God loves them and that God has provided a way to save them from their sins, they have to believe that we honestly love them and care about them. Not only our neighbor, but our spouse. Ephesians says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Your husband say, man, I'd do that. I'd die for her. Why, why do we always go to the extreme? What about doing the dishes every now and then? What about helping her with the kids? What about caring, caring about her? That, that, don't always go to the extreme. What, wife says, well, I love him. Well, do you respect him? Do you, do you honor him? That's, that's truly what love is, not the lovey-dovey stuff. It, it, it's, it's, it's respecting your husband. Miss Billy Graham, uh, Billy Graham's wife, said this. She said, it's your job to love your husbands. It's God's job to make them good. 1 Corinthians says uh, that love is, is patient. Love is kind. Love is, is forgiveness. Love is not prideful. It's not 
easily angered. And, and you know 1 Corinthians 13, that, that's the love chapter. But it doesn't give a definition of love, but it does show you what love looks like. When we try to define things, it, it kind of damages what, what it truly is. It would be like trying to define a sunset on, on a beach. When you try to explain it, you, you don't really get the full picture. Or it would be like trying to explain the Grand Canyon. It, you, when you try to put it in words, you don't get the full picture. That's the same way with love. Love, there's not a definition that I could give you that, that you could take and, and put love in, in a few words. Their love is so much more richer and so much deeper and so much more vast than, than I can put it into words. But I will tell you this. Here's one thing that you can take to the bank and hang on to. The closer that you get to God and the better understanding of Jesus that you have, the better understanding of what love is. You'll have a better understanding of what love is. The closer that we get to him. A poem that, that I wrote down, it says, Here lies a miser who lived for himself, cared for nothing but gathering wealth. How is he or how, it, or how he fares? Nobody knows and nobody cares. People will forget things that you said. People will forget all of the things that you did. But people will never forget how much you love them. There, there are people in my, in my mind that I have right now that didn't, that didn't write me a big check. They didn't, you know, they didn't do all these extravagant things for me. They, they, they didn't do anything you know, just supernatural and special, but they love me. And that's what I remember more, more than anything, more than any gift I ever received. Not only do we need to prepare for the fire, I gave you a few things. Serving God, our attitude, being thankful and loving sincerely. There's, there's a whole much more that I could go into, but I'm not going to. That's, that's preparing for revival. That's preparing for the fire to fall. Not only do we need to prepare, but we need to pour out our faith. Look in verse 33. It says, Then he arranged the wood and cut the ox in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, fill four pitchers with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. The water flowed around the altar, and he also filled the trench with water. Now, I've, I, I, I've never heard, I've heard one or two, but not many pre preachers preach on these few verses. If, you're gonna, if you want to set something on fire, why would you put water on it? Why, why would you pour water on something that, that you want God uh, to set on fire? When we go to grill or something like that, we put, we put lighter fluid on, on, on the grill, not water, because we want to set it on fire. What Elijah did here is he, he applied every bit of faith he had and put it totally on God. He, he said he, he wanted to make it clear to everybody, all of them prophets, all of them people that were worshiping Baal, if anything happened, if any fire fell from heaven, it was totally 100% of God, not nothing to me. And if we as a church want to experience the, the power and the presence of God, then we have to put it totally on God. We cannot do it in our own strength. Not only do we need to pour out our faith, but we need to pray for the fire. Verse 36 says this. It says, At the time of the offering of the Eden sacrifice, the, uh, Elijah the prophet came near and said, Listen to his prayer. He said, O oh Lord, O oh, uh, is a sign of fear and reverence. We, I know I have. I, I've lost the O in my prayers. I've lost the, 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 des the cry of desperation. What he's saying, he says, oh, Lord, God, if you don't do it, it's not going to get done. God, it, it, you are the only one that, that can do it. Look what he says here. He says, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, referring to everything that God's done in the past. Today, let it be known that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their heart back again. He's saying, answer me, answer me. This is a cry of desperation. This is a cry out to, to, to God. He, he is putting every all of the faith that he has in God and he's calling out to God because he says, God, if you don't do it, it's not going to get done. 
And church, I'm here to tell you, if God does not do it, it's not going to get done. No matter how much we try to force it, no matter how much we try to conjure up, if God doesn't do it, it's not going to get done. With this name it and claim it stuff that, preach, that preachers are preaching on TV and everything, we, we see that and we see the, 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 how wrong they are. But I believe that some of us have gone so far the other way that we are missing out on the supernatural power of God. God has given us prayer in order for us to, to, to be able to conversate and to be able to call out to God and totally rely on Him at any time, a day or not. Praying, God has commanded us to pray. Praying is our job. Answering prayers is God's job. He knows what's best. He sees the whole picture. He, he knows what is best. He knows if we need a yes. He knows if we need a maybe. He knows if we need a no. And I'm going to tell you, what I've learned over, over my short time here on this earth is that God's no is better than any yes that he could ever give. When God says no, he's protecting you from things. He, he's seeing the full picture. He, he, he knows what's the best. And when he gives you a no, that's the best answer he could give. Y'all ever heard the story of the Chinese farmer? There was a Chinese farmer in a little town. And his horse ran away. And the whole town came over. And they said, well, that, that's, that's, bad. that's a bad thing, man. He said, well, maybe. The next day, seven wild horses came up and, and was grazing in his field, and, and the town came over and said, hey, you, you got seven wild horses. I know that one ran off, but you got more. That's a good thing. He said, well, maybe. The next day, his son went out on one of them wild horses and broke his leg, and the town came over and said, you know, that, that's tough luck. I mean, that, that's a bad thing. And he says, well, maybe. The next day, the military officers came by and were 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 doing a draft to, to draft into war, and they skipped over his son because of his broken leg. And, and they said, well, that, that's a good thing. And he says, well, maybe. The point of that is, is we don't know what's good or bad. We don't know what things that, 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 that happen in our life, whether they're going to turn out good or turn out bad and uh, negatively affect us or positive. We don't, we don't know, but God knows. And when he gives you a no, that is okay and that is better, like I said, than any yes he could ever give you. Not only did, did he pray with passion, he prayed that God be glorified through his service. Look what he says. He says, let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I've done all these things at your word. Do you get the point here? When Jesus prayed, prayed the, the Lord's Prayer, that, that was an example for us to follow. He said, our, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. You get the point? Our, how many times are, is our prayers all about me, 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 me? We are to be praying that God, no matter what happens, that God be glorified. Not only did he pray that God be glorified, but he prayed for his enemy's salvation. Look in verse 37. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people, this people, these people that have been trying, if you'll read back in the early chapters, these people were, were the people who just tried to kill all the prophets of God or who were trying to put all these people to death. And he says, this people, answer me, that this people may know that you are Lord and that you are God and that you have turned their hearts Back again, these people who just tried to kill all of the godly men in Israel. He said, I'm praying that you save those people. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, he says, But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Elijah could have prayed, God, I'm praying for this fire to fall. But hey, when this fire falls, just take, take them out with it. You know what I mean? We could, I, 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 we could pray that too. But God, I'm glad God didn't, didn't take that attitude toward us. Amen. God extended us mercy. God extended us love. God extended us grace. And he's trying to do the same for them. Do not get in the way of that. It's very hard to have bitterness, anger, 
unforgiveness when you are praying for somebody. Not only do we need to prepare for the fire, not only do we need to pour out our faith, not only do we need to pray for God's will and pray for the fire, but lastly, and I want to close with this, Jonah, if you want to start coming up, I want us, I want us to see the product of the fire. What happens when the, when the fire does fall? The first thing that happens is it consumes everything. Look in verse 38. It says, then. I'm glad that word then is there because then it means after this. After uh, Elijah has done his preparing, after he's repaired his worship, after, after he's put all his faith in me and he knows that if I don't send it, it's not going to get sent. And after he's prayed and called out to me in desperation, after he's, he's not prayed selfishly, he's prayed for, for God to be glorified. He says, after all that, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. It consumed everything. Now that's true revival. What I mean by that is in order, true revival is when God consumes everything of our life. We can't serve God in church and at work in front of everybody and forget Him when we get home. It consumes everything. It consumes our whole life. When we're by ourselves, when when we're at church, when we're it's just uh, us and so it consumes everything. Not only does it consume everything, but lost people get saved. Look in verse thirty nine. It says, "When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God.' All of these people who were tr- trying to eradicate God, trying to kill everybody that stood for Him." They said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, they got saved. Jesus said, if I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. Listen, I heard one, we, we were doing a, a ministry event, and one person said, you know, they're just too far gone. It doesn't matter where people are at. It may look like it to us that they'll never turn, they'll never, they'll, they'll never understand and serve God and, and, and truly get saved, but they are never too far gone for God. Lastly, not only will it consume everything, not only will lost people be saved, but listen to this. Here's, here's one of the best parts. God will make up for the years of drought. Look in verse 41. It says, now Elijah said to Ahab, go up and eat and drink, for there is sound, there is the sound of the roar of a heavy shower. Now remember, Israel is in a drought because they started worshiping Baal, and God sent judgment on them. It says, so, so Ahab went to eat and drink, but Elijah went up to the top of, of Carmel, and he crouched down on the earth and put his face between his knees. He said to his servants, go up now, look toward the sea. So he, he went up. And looked and said, there is nothing. And he said, go back seven times. It came about at the seventh time that he said, behold, a cloud as small as a man's hand is coming up from the sea. And he said, go up and say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down so that the heavy shower does not stop you. In a little while, the sky grew black with clouds clouds and wind, and there was a heavy shower. And Ahab rode, and he went to Jezreel. Then the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins, and outran Ahab to Jezreel. God God made up for those three and a half years of drought. He sent rain, a heavy shower, and a heavy wind, wind, and made up for all of the the rejection, all of of the, the... the lack of of service to God everything that that they did God made up for it and we think sometimes that that we've messed up and and that now God can't use us or, or something like that I don't know God can make up for anything that we think we've gone too far on or anything that that we may see as unfit or or not able to be used because of this this and in this if we will do what God has told us to do if we will repair our worship and get our worship right, and if we will truly pour out our faith to God and give it all totally to Him, 
And when we do that, we truly call out to God and pray. God, I'm not saying God can send revival. I'm saying he will send revival. But we have to do what God says and do it God's way or it's not going to get.